Um, and on behalf of CPE, Bay Resistance, our Resource and Organizing Center, and the Anti-Police Terror Project, welcome back to Palestine Solidarity Announcements. Uh, these are weekly updates on Palestine where we share uh, the most recent calls to action and uh, solidarity work, and of course, give updates on what's happening on the ground, um, following news stories, um, both domestically and in Gaza. And if you can, please share these updates with your comrades, colleagues, and friends, and you can find the recordings on CPE's YouTube channel. This coming Monday at 8.30 a.m. at the Superior Court in San Francisco at 850 Bryant Street, organizers are asking our Bay Area communities to show up in support of the Golden Gate 26. 26 protesters of conscience who took to the Golden Gate Bridge this past April to engage in civil disobedience in opposition to the genocide in Gaza. Just as the Bay Bridge protesters did last year, the Golden Gate 26 demanded an immediate ceasefire and an end to U.S. taxpayer monies being spent to kill Palestinian children and their families. They were arrested and jailed and later shared that they were treated harshly during their time in custody. Just a month ago, San Francisco District Attorney Brooke Jenkins filed a series of charges against the protesters, which included felony, yes, felony, conspiracy charges, and 38 counts of false imprisonment for each of the protesters. Warrants were then issued for their arrest, and they were forced to surrender to custody in the middle of last month. Make no mistake, these charges are intended to repress Palestine solidarity movement activity and are part and parcel of a program of backlash against what has been a revolutionizing and transformational social movement for all oppressed peoples throughout the globe. The repression that's been seen on university campuses this fall uh, from students um, is part of this uh, attempt to muffle dissent. Um, and it's also the muffling of this dissent with the, ele the electoral system. And it's the kind of criminalization of movement activity from the state that follows a long historical trajectory, trajectory within the U.S. empire. However, the legal team for the Golden Gate 26 has elucidated and emphasized that this particular prosecution appears to be clearly politically motivated at the behest of Israel, AIPAC, and Zionist political forces within the U.S., in an August 20th letter written to D.A. Jenkins, the legal team identified numerous instances in which similar past protests, including the 1989 Golden Gate Bridge protest to stop AIDS, Woody Harrelson's scaling of the bridge in 1996 to save a Redwood Grove, and a 2016 BLM protest, all snarled traffic but were dealt with as infractions and then dismissed. Instead, Jenkins' office has clearly wildly overcharged the protesters in this case. But why? The legal team points to the Jenkins uh, to Jenkins' unpublicized meetings with the Israeli consulate, consulate in which she received gifts as late as December of this past year. They point to her director of public affairs, who was formerly the political education director of APAC. They point to Jenkins herself, who is on record as calling San Francisco marches for ceasefire as, quote, pro-Hamas. And finally, they point to her assistant DA, Michael Menasini, who described Arabs as, quote, brutal invaders or hate mongers and Nazis, who needed to, quote, be sent back to their native homelands. According to the legal team, all of these factors require that Jenkins recuse herself from this case and that the charges be reconsidered and then dismissed. This kind of political prosecution of protests, let alone Palestinian activism, is not unique, but it is uniquely evil to see this kind of expenditure of public resources to perse persecute criminalize and jeopardize the lives and well-being of conscientious objectors to genocide while the U.S. war machine funds, cheerleads, and equivocates about the genocide in Gaza each day. It's also a warning sign for all of us involved in Palestine solidarity work and a call to action to show up for each other and engage in strong, consistent movement defense. We'll share some more information towards the end of our uh, PSA today on how you can show up at the courthouse and the petition that's being circulated. Um, but it's good to know that this legal battle won't likely be a short one, and it won't likely be the last. So this coming Monday is an important first step in continuing the fight for Palestine and for each other. And so we hope to see you there on Monday. And with that, I will turn it over to Melissa Fan to ground us in a short somatics practice. Hi, everyone. Welcome. As we are less than one month away from the anniversary of October 7th, 
I want to validate that you might be feeling increasing feelings of exacerbation, frustration, anger, rage, sadness, grief, numbness, exhaustion, disbelief. You might notice that these feelings, whatever your experience is, increases in intensity the closer and closer we get to the actual date. Just be mindful, be aware of what's happening within your body, within your soul, within your psyche, so that you can channel it, ground, be in community, and not um, project or lash out at other people. And when times get more heightened, more stressed, we return to the basics. So today we're gonna to return to the basics of grounding in the earth. Right now, finding your body as you are in this moment. Simply noticing your physical position. Are you sitting or standing? Are you moving around? Are you multitasking? Just noticing what you're doing with your body and how it feels in this very moment. Noticing places of discomfort, places of neutrality, places that might feel at ease or pleasurable. And just as you're noticing, begin to redirect your conscious attention down to your feet, to the lowest extremities that you have. And if you can, I invite you to place your feet or another body part down and touch the floor or the ground where you are. And noticing here just the weight of your body on earth. Noticing that your body is in connection to the earth at all times. From the day that you were born until this very moment, all the way until you die. And if you can, I invite you to imagine rooting down into the earth. Imagining roots growing from your body down through the floor, through the structure of the building that you might be in, all the way down reaching the earth below, the dirt and the rocks, the minerals, the earth below. as we're consciously connecting to the earth, taking a moment to appreciate that even without conscious connection, the earth is always holding you. In this place, we can reaffirm every person's dignity that we are all equally held by the earth. And 
And feeling here the connection to the earth and through this connection, the connection to all other living things, the plants, the trees, the other animals, people, throughout time. Sending breaths down through your body, down, rooting into the earth. And remembering that this is a practice you can do anytime and always. When you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling exhausted, when you're feeling joyous, the earth can hold it all. So I invite you for the duration of this call and throughout your week and really throughout the next um, several weeks to adopt this practice, to make it your own, to root and connect with the earth. Thank you for practicing with me today. Melissa, thanks so much for grounding us. Uh, we always receive so much uh, positive feedback and appreciation for your tireless work in, in helping us ground these conversations each week and, and orient ourselves so that we can process this, this information together. Um, Samer, it's good to have you back. Um, I know it's been a busy week uh, for AROC, um, including last night's uh, launch of the AROC action. Um, I... We're about uh, less than a month from the anniversary um, or the, you know, the anniversary of October 7th and then now less than two months, right, uh, from the election. Um, I'm not going to ask you too big a question about um, about where you think things stand. I think we'll get through that in the slides and I think you're going to move us through a lot of what's going on on the ground. But um, in terms of your own assessment of sort of uh, the energies and where folks are um, with all of these different things kind of culminating in some 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 significant kind of um uh points in time how are you how are you feeling about uh, uh things heading into the this what i think is in some ways the last stretch of this very long period of time yeah I, you know it's great to be back uh thanks thomas um i i, I think i struggle with it i I feel like we're constantly in this feeling of like, this is a really pivotal moment. So it feels very trite to call it a pivotal moment, but it does very much feel like the most movement we're going to get in terms of like commitments in the United States for a different change of course are going to happen in the next two months to the extent that we're going to be able to win those. And to the extent that we're not, it does feel like we're looking at, you know, folks are, are really caught on early November as being this like, change but it's not right like the change is january so uh, you know i think like there's a lot to be said about both what we can do to change dynamics and to force the harris campaign and particularly which is now i think um having lost its sort of like initial enthusiasm bump maybe in a more vulnerable position than it was a few weeks ago whether they'll actually be rational about that vulnerability is a very, very different question, obviously, as we saw with the Biden campaign. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. There are days when I feel optimistic. There are days when I feel less optimistic. And I would say today I'm feeling a little bit mixed. That's fair. Yeah, um, I think I was at an event last night um, around climate and militarism, and a lot of the focus was on um, Palestine and you know how much uh, both of those movements... Uh, are kind of converging as a result of the uh, Gaza genocide and some, you know, both the sober assessment that everyone feels ex obviously very frustrated with the lack of progress on the ceasefire front, but also that, you know, there are now these major pathways towards coalescing these movements in ways that are more effective um, for Gaza. And, you know, I, th I still think that there's a sense of um, uh, angst about figuring out how to mobilize as quickly as possible, right? Like that there are long-term questions of movement building 
that we're working through as we're also trying to think about effective interventions in the current moment. And, you know, for not to bring it back to the, where we started too much, but I do think that uh, some of the work around defense is very important. And so uh, just a reminder that, you know, uh, we've been, folks have been doing direct actions, but folks, there are consequences for those direct actions that are kind of playing out in different ways than they did earlier in, in this long year. And uh, so it's important uh, for us to be showing up in defense of, of our comrades. Um, but with that, let, let me uh, hand it over to you to sort of work us, walk us through uh, this week's updates. Thanks again for being back. Thanks, Thomas. And yeah, I think that's spot on. And like, you know, important to remember that the more we win and the closer we get, the worse that repression is going to be. So we definitely need to be on strong footing now so that when it gets worse and it, it will before it gets better, that we're well positioned for that. Um, let me share my screen once again, um, a week absolutely full of fresh horrors uh, and some hope. Um, excited to go through it all with you all. Um, just getting started, you know, the, the polio vaccination campaign, um, is ongoing in Gaza. They're claiming, I think, to have vaccinated, uh, five or 600,000 now, if I'm not mistaken, it might be a little more at this point. Um, the truces that people were hoping for, um, in this vaccination campaign have like half materialized, you know, there, there are places where the fighting is stopping, but not in a sustained or structured enough way to really meaningfully put a dent into Israel's carnage, unfortunately. So the official death toll ticked up by another 250 or so this week. Uh, areas that were polio vaccination sites um, were evacuated and bombed. So like there isn't really consistency even there in terms of like the opportunity for a respite. Um, but uh the dynamics of that are interesting in the ways that it is sort of forcing Israel to um, moderate some of like the worst of its military offensives and stuff. And just to say, like, I think the Israeli military, at least at its higher echelons, is taking this vaccination campaign seriously, um, not particularly because they necessarily care about Palestinians, obviously, but because um as with any like highly infectious disease, there's a high risk of spreading. Uh, Israel has a very large population of unvaccinated folks, particularly in the ultra-Orthodox community. So I think the, the fear is that it blows back in, uh, particularly now that the ultra-Orthodox folks are technically um, in some small number, like part of the fighting forces. Um, uh, with that in mind, um, I'll do my usual, like starting at the Southern tip and working my way up. Uh, the like big ish development from Rafah this past week is that um, the IDF is in like a sort of George W. Bush on an aircraft carrier style declaring mission accomplished. Um, they're saying that the um, Hamas Rafah brigade has been defeated. Um, worth noting here that again, the the previous assertion of four brigades has vanished and now it's just the one. And now that one has ostensibly been defeated. Um, if folks remember, you know, we talked about this a few months ago, but uh, the IDF actually has a really specific definition of what it means by defeated, which is just that like the communication control from the highest commander of the brigade all the way down is cut. Um, so they are obviously claiming a lot of fighters being killed, but like in the same way that the brigades that they claimed were defeated in the North have reconstituted themselves. Um, I wouldn't put too much stock into that assertion, even if it is true, which it very well may not be. Uh, and yeah, to that note, there was a mysterious um, helicopter crash uh, the same day that they announced um, that that uh, their, their so-called victory, where um, a helicopter which was going to rescue wounded soldiers itself crashed. Uh, with no explanation from the Israelis about who the wounded people were that they were trying to rescue and why the helicopter crashed. Um, so I think that says a lot about the the control that they claim to be having in, in southern Rafah. Uh, meanwhile, on the border itself, the, um, uh, the Palestinian Authority president, Mahmoud Abbas, had claimed that he was going to come visit Gaza. He made a big speech about it. 
a few weeks ago that we were going to discuss in the PSA and I ended up cutting it for time. My apologies. Uh, mostly because I didn't think that he would actually go. Um, and uh, he apparently did get clearance from the Egyptian government this past week um, to get through the border to go visit Gaza. And then, of course, Israel refused his entry. So um, he did not, in fact, end up going. Um, but the um, EU uh, vice president president did make a visit and 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 put out a statement that um is not a bad one i do recommend folks give it a read it's uh all about sort of among other things like all the aid that has piled up on the on the egyptian side of the, the rafah crossing and the ways in which israel is like refusing to let um particular types of things through well they're, they're refusing to let anything through and like the the justifications that they use that he actually goes into in some detail in this piece, which is, is, is good. Like for example, um, there are trucks full of energy bars, which is by far uh, the most efficient way of providing people in Gaza, their caloric needs because they're like calorically dense. Um, and Israel has banned energy bars altogether um, from entering Gaza because they classify them as a luxury item and no luxury items are allowed across the border. Um, so I would give that a read if you get a chance. Um, moving up a little bit, of course, I would say the big news from Gaza this week was the um, giant strike on the El Moasi camp, um, a tent village safe zone that was hit by, I believe, one of the 2,000-pound uh, bombs. Um, you can see uh, in the, the video on the right there how deep the crater is um, from this strike on tents. Like they were hitting tents with this bomb. Uh, and I, I I mean, like, you know, even having looked at all of this stuff for 11 months now, I think I was just really struck by uh, by the magnitude of the devastation of this thing. Um, particularly poignant, I feel like, in a moment where uh, whatever extremely tepid um, U.S. restrictions were being placed on Israel are now all being lifted so I don't know if the Biden administration is sending new 2,000 pound bombs yet. Uh, it, they've been quite cagey about it. My understanding is that they are, or at least that they're not claiming to be blocking them anymore. Whether or not they're actually shipping them um, is a little bit unclear to me. But this, this is of course what those 2,000 pound bombs do um, in a you know in a way that's absolutely they're like there's there's no conceivable justification for even if they knew. Uh, targets that they had identified were there, like why you would use a 2000 pound bomb on a tent village. Um, so yeah, there's a lot about El Moasi that I imagine pe folks have already read about, but I, I yeah, just an, like the latest in a very long string of absolute horrors um, with no accountability, of course. Um, moving up a little bit to Gaza City, uh, in addition to additional strikes on UN staff and humanitarian aid workers, um, the IDF has once again killed a number of um, I the Israeli prisoners um, in a, a, a strike that killed three um, of the hostages, uh, which, again, you know, I think we, we spoke last week, too, about the the change now ever since like the, the rescue operation from a few months ago, um, where it's no longer possible for the IDF to really rescue soldiers militarily and all military actions from now on are basically just either going to kill the hostages uh, or drive them deeper underground. And this is the, again, logical consequence of that, but we continue to see it happen. And while um, the Israeli public appears to be extremely upset about this, you know, you're seeing all of these like giant protests and whatever, it still is barely reaching um, Western press. I don't know that it made it at all. I looked around and I didn't see any articles in Western press about the IDF killing three more hostages, but I may have missed it. Uh, as Thomas said, it was a bit of a crazy week for me. So my apologies if I didn't catch it. Um, moving to the West Bank, uh, I wanted to highlight two uh, articles that I just think are worth um, a little bit of attention if you have the time. Um, on the left, um, this AP piece, um, was this really remarkable and I actually think quite well done um, like look into what is happening to Palestinian youth in the West Bank right now, you know, where, uh, as we've been discussing for a few weeks now, the 
Um, IDF has been conducting the largest military operation um, in the West Bank since the last Intifada. Um, and so like the the carnage that they're unleash unleashing um, against everybody and the way that they're targeting young men, particularly, uh, it, it's a devastating read, but I think it's really powerfully done. And then the Al Jazeera article on the right, um, I think, did a really good job of showing the sort of long term economic impacts of not only this assault on the West Bank that started a month ago, um, but everything Israel has been doing since October to the West Bank, where, again, there is no Hamas, um, that will be, I think, it, it, like the rebuilding that will be necessary in Gaza because of the near total economic collapse being caused by um, Israel's stranglehold of the West Bank right now um, uh, is really something and definitely worth worth a read. The uh, West Bank news that I think most people have been talking about this week, um, you know, we, we covered it very briefly because it had just happened uh, in last Sunday's PSA, or I'm sorry, last Friday's PSA, um, was the assassination um, by an IDF sniper of um, uh, Aisha Nur Ezgi Aegi, who is a, a, a Turkish American woman, um, who, like, if you, you know, like very quickly glance at Western media headlines, you get the impression raised a lot of consternation from U.S. officials. You know, you can see here that Blinken is slamming Israel. And the Guardian says that Biden called the the killing totally unacceptable, um, as will be surprising to, I'm sure, zero people on this call. Um, these sort of like feigned acts of outrage obviously didn't go any further than these headlines. And there have been absolutely no consequences, no accountability and no repercussions um, for the, again, targeted assassination of this woman. Uh, and sure enough, you know, um, the spin machine started more or less immediately where Biden um, is now claiming that uh, the sniper shot to her head was accidental and unintentional and that was a ricochet off of the pavement, which is like not a thing, which is really obviously not a thing. And just to note here, like almost verbatim parrots the exact same thing that the IDF had said about Shireen Abu Akleh. Um, when she was assassinated, when an investigation uh, determined that, of course, that wasn't remotely true, and she was, of course, directly assassinated, that it wasn't unintentional in any way. Um, and the the Washington Post has has done a good uh, piece already, sort of debunking that. Um, there have been some calls for accountability that I think um, are 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 really um, worthwhile, including. Um, the senator from Washington and Pramila Jaipal, the congresswoman, um, who are both calling for an actual investigation and some accountability and, and use language that is a little bit closer to, I think, acknowledging the fact that with impunity, the Israeli military like assassinated a U.S. citizen and they can do that with impunity because they have impunity. Um, we'll come back around shortly to... Um, Blinken slamming Israel and uh, Biden calling things unacceptable um, when we see the latest round of what they've done. But before we get there, uh, a quick detour into Lebanon where uh, the violence continues to escalate. There's uh, a, a large scale set of Israeli airstrikes um, that once again has killed a senior Hezbollah commander. Um, Hezbollah responded with another large rocket barrage um, across northern Israel, which remains evacuated and largely cut off from the rest of the country. Um, it's, I think it's it, it's good to take a moment to uh, note some of the investigations that have been done about how this sort of border conflict is developing and the ways in which um, Israel is clearly using uh, what they're calling a scorched earth policy across southern Lebanon. You know, this is the latest iteration of the same sort of thing that they're doing in Gaza, but also the thing that they were doing in Lebanon in 2006, which is um, their famed Dahye doctrine. That's this military doctrine of the IDF named after the suburb of Beirut that they completely annihilated in 2006. The idea being that 
if Israel causes enough broad devastation to the general public, that that causes the public to turn against um, the military or like militant group um, that Israel is fighting. Um, it didn't work in Dahia in 2006, where, you know, Hezbollah's credibility skyrocketed and ended with them like taking control of the entire government. It's obviously not working in Gaza and it's not going to work in Lebanon either. Why they continue to expect a different outcome is anybody's guess. And, you know, the sort of um, range of hypotheses there, I would say, go from like, you know, this like broken colonial machine that doesn't really know how to do anything else. You know, it's, uh, when you're a hammer, every problem is a nail sort of thing where like the only response is indiscriminate violence and they don't really know how else to be strategic to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the possibility that like the stated aim is not the actual aim and the idea of like, you know, terrorizing the public into um, into like turning on Hezbollah isn't really the aim. The aim is just the devastation. Like the cruelty is the point possible uh, where it is on that line. I don't know. And does it make a difference? I don't know. <laughs> um, has, uh, Al Jazeera did a really good job of mapping um, where um Israel and Lebanon have been hitting each other over these past 11 months. You can see like the disproportionate amount in which Israel has really tried to basically um, strike as much of Southern Lebanon as possible. Um, and there's a lot uh, like the, the different analyses in that article are, are quite good. Um, moving into the ceasefire stuff. Uh, um, we, we are where we were last week. Uh, which is the United States pushing this sort of like final take it or leave it end of the road ceasefire agreement that, you know, last week um, when we talked about it last Friday, they had mentioned that it was coming very shortly. And so I, I think I, I definitely assumed that it was going to be out by now. It's not. So that last round of ceasefire proposals that the U.S. is supposedly going to put forward still hasn't been put forward, at least as of last night, last I checked. Um, so what that will look like and whether it will be able to create some sort of breakthrough, I, we're not going to know until it's actually out. I would say the prospect of that is quite slim. Um, Hamas is already, I think, trying to set the stage of what could be within the parameters of that last proposal by saying, hey, the proposal that Biden put out um, like three months ago, we will accept that as it is, at which they've said several times. But I think... Um, they're trying to message something very specific here, which is like, we are okay with the agreement that the US and the international community is okay with. Let's not add anything like a very clear, very clean um, uh, like strategy to say, hey, that thing that Biden called Israel's proposal, we accept it. Um, but doing that with the understanding that Israel obviously isn't willing to accept that proposal, Netanyahu has made it very clear um, that uh, new conditions do need to be added. And again, whether he's doing that to sort of increase his position in the ceasefire negotiations or to kill them, I think in that case, we can say with some confidence, he's just doing it to kill the ceasefire negotiations. So it doesn't seem very likely. I don't know what proposal the U.S. could put out now um, that would meet that sort of unbridgeable distance between those two parties. Um, and you can even see like the the members of the Israeli cabinet that have been calling for a ceasefire agreement and have been bashing Netanyahu for not pursuing one or saying, okay, yeah, let's, let's try for a temporary truce, which is sort of a tacit, uh, a tacit acknowledgement to the idea that the long-term permanent ceasefire is not really on the table right now. Um, I, I read this New Yorker article this past week, um, about, how Netanyahu is is like introducing poison pill into the ceasefire negotiations. Uh, it's an interview with the like one of the the heads of the International Crisis Group, which uh, sort of produces conflict like global conflict analysis that tends to be quite good, all things considered, given given its like general disposition. Um, and I think this this quote really struck me um, where uh, they were talking about why the Philadelphia corridor has become this sort of um, red line for Netanyahu that he's not willing to compromise on. 
and um, the interviewee says, you know, Israel has now spent a year grinding down both Hamas's military and the territory. I don't know if you're going to ask me about Israel's end game, but you're seeing it. Meaning this is the end game. Like what he what he wants is this. Like this sort of, you know, we we called it recently the West Bankification of Gaza, right? Like the Israeli military is just in there. They do these like like targeted bombings and raids constantly. Uh, they play this like whack-a-mole game um, at the at the cost of hundreds of Palestinian lives every week. Um, and yeah, like uh, you know, um, given that. Netanyahu has been clear that he wants Israel to remain in control. Uh, by this analysis, Israel doesn't uh, Israel isn't going to replace Netanyahu as prime minister. Like his approval rating is going back up now. Um, and so, like the way that it was described in this article is, we're already looking at the day after, right? So, like the idea of this post-war, what does Gaza look like? It might be this, unless Israel is forced um into conceding out of this right so like until they're basically ousted either militarily on the ground or through you know diplomatic global popular pressure um this is the place that it stays and i i think you know it it, it was a real gut punch to read that but i i think the analysis is not wrong um a, another really powerful interview that i think is worth reading um is with uh, William Burns, the director of the CIA, who we've talked about many times in the PSAs. You know, there's sort of two high-ranking U.S. administration officials that are moving U.S. policy in Palestine right now. Um, there's Anthony Blinken and there's William Burns. They have very, very different approaches and very, very different perspectives. Uh, my personal take is that Anthony Blinken is not a very smart, thoughtful, or strategic person. He just sort of like kind of a dummy. Um, I think Thomas and I have had that discussion, and, and you know, like have have a diff different differing perspectives on that. But I think we would probably agree that of the two, William Burns is definitely the adult in the room, not in the sense that he has good politics in any way, shape, or form. He's the director of the CIA, for God's sake. But like. Uh, he at least, I think, what you get from William Burns is a more accurate assessment of like where he actually stands and what he really thinks. Like there's there's less there's less BS with William Burns, I suppose, uh, and there's a more like nuanced perspective of what's actually happening. So this interview um, that uh, William Burns did last weekend with the Financial Times, I think, is is very telling, uh, and I think it's it's worth reading in its entirety. He talks about Ukraine a lot. Um, but his sections in on um, uh, what's happening in Gaza and what's happening in the West Bank are, are definitely worth a read. You know, like for everything that the rest of the U.S. administration is saying about a ceasefire being 90 percent, you know, like 90 percent there. Um, Burns basically says, like, no, it's not. You know, and he, he says, like, I can't sit here today and tell you that we're going to succeed. Like, he doesn't think the ceasefire is going to go through. Um, and he. He said something that I had not appreciated previously, which is that when the White House says 90 percent, like we're at the 90 percent line for these ceasefire negotiations, they mean that the parties have agreed to 90 percent of the terms, which like, yeah, duh, that's not actually a really impressive thing to do. Like it's the last 10 percent that's going to be, you know, the stuff that people disagree about is the thing that makes it hard to move forward. So like the fact that you agree on most of it doesn't really mean anything. Um so that that sort of like honest analysis, I think, is 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 worth um, diving into. You get a much better perspective of what the real U.S. Uh, position here is, as opposed to like the Anthony Blinken, you know, performative one. Um, and what we're seeing from the U.S. is like a renewed commitment to arms transfers to Israel. Um, you know, there's another hundred and sixty million dollar weapon sale um, just this past week. Um, sorry, just yesterday, I, I believe it was announced. Um, and so again, like loss in the miasma of all this other news, these sort of continued new weapon sales. This one is for 2027. So um, it's not meant to be delivered anytime soon. But the fact that they're doing another $100 million weapon sale is really something, um, particularly in light of a series of new polls that have come out um, from like 
center or right wing pollsters uh, that have shown like the rapid uh, decline in U.S. popular support for um, providing weapons to Israel. And I like I pulled out one that I was really struck by um, from the Cato Institute this past week. And this is a, a poll of voters in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Michigan. Um, and the top line, you know, like the way that pollsters talk about their polls is always so different than what the actual polling data shows. So if there are any other numbers nerds out there, I really recommend looking at the cross tabs. You get a very different story than what you get from like the one page, whatever press release about what the what the um what the poll summary says that people think. So I pulled out, for example, some of the numbers here uh, from Wisconsin, just to like to pick one at random. Um, the numbers are even starker, frankly, in Michigan. But, you know, I just wanted to give an example that wasn't that wouldn't lead you to think like it's just because of the Arab American vote or whatever where um, voters for vo people who said they were planning on voting for Kamala Harris um, by a 81 to 19 percent margin. So like 80 to 20 percent uh, thinks that the United States can't fix problems in the Middle East by sending money, soldiers or resources by a two to one margin. They're saying that um, the U.S.'s involvement in the Middle East has worsened U.S. national security um, this one really struck me that, you know, they asked, you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of Israel and only 25% of Democratic voters have a favorable per, uh, opinion of Israel at this point. Um, that, like almost half as, of the number that have an unfavorable opinion at 40%. Um, and like their split on whether Hamas's reasons for fighting Israel are valid or not valid. That's a position that I never thought um, would be a sort of like plurality in U.S. popular opinion. And yet here we are. Um, by a two to one margin, they oppose sending weapons and money to Israel. Um, and by like an eight to one margin, they think the U.S. should put conditions on U.S. military aid to Israel. It's wild, right? I feel like it made my head spin to see these numbers and be like, OK, well, even in the light of even in light of all of that, like, you know, the Harris administration isn't making any moves in that direction. And I think part of the answer here is actually what's at the top of this poll. Right. These are people who said they're planning on voting for Kamala Harris. So, like, yeah, she doesn't really have to bend because they're already going to vote for her. So um, that's the bit of the conundrum. I feel like the the anti-war left finds itself in in this moment. I wish I could give you a good way out, but just to say that this is obviously the moment for pressure on the on the Harris campaign to the extent that that exists. Um, so, uh, yeah, like we need to move while they're vulnerable to the extent that we can. And I don't know how much we can. Um, more globally on the arms embargo front, um, this just this past week, uh, the Canadian government has now suspended 30 permits for arms shipments to Israel. That's um, in addition to uh, the UK, the UK's suspension of arms shipments. Um, although uh, Anthony Blinken, in all of his outrage at Israel, is apparently behind the scenes trying to get the UK to reconsider its weapons suspensions and start sending those weapons again. So no surprises there about our buddy Tony Blinken. Um, the small ICJ news that I just wanted to touch on quickly, um, is just that, you know, there was some fake news going around this past week that the ICJ, um, case by South Africa was being like postponed or suspended because South Africa didn't have any evidence, which is obviously of course on its face, uh, blatantly untrue. So, um, that case is continuing, uh, the new round of, um, like documents uh, and like uh, uh, like whatever case petitions being put forward by the South African government is happening, I believe, this coming week. Um, for the Harris campaign, uh, I, I'm sure folks saw the, um, the the sort of indistinguishable rhetoric that came from both her and Donald Trump at the debate. I pulled out um, one of the big quotes there about always giving Israel the ability to defend itself. And... Um, the Harris campaign website has now finally put up policy positions for the first time, and they've taken basically the the same language that she's been using um, 
and has thrown it up there as her policy on Palestine, which is um, pretty atrocious. Uh, and again, you know, just to note, like, she continues to use this language of like sexual violence on October 7th and has yet to say a single thing about, of course, all of the documented sexual violence that's been uh, committed against Palestinians. Um, campus protests up and running, um, taking up space and making moves already, which is really exciting to see. Um, the, uh, sorry, just a second. Um, sorry about that. Um, not much more to say about the campus protests other than um, uh, we are seeing sort of heightened repression around those protests. Uh, uh, the new rules that have been put in place by uh, um, UCLA or like, the, sorry, the, the University of California generally um, and, and universities in New York um, have been really, really something, including mask bans, which is, you know, like a, a wild thing to do in the midst of one of the biggest COVID surges in history. Um, meanwhile, uh, the anti-Palestinian right-wing forces on campus that are doxing students and harassing them directly continue to operate with total impunity. Um, yeah, it's a real site and there's a lot about like the what's happening on these campuses and their relationship with the defense department and so on that we could of course get into um i wanted to add this even though i don't have much information on it yet but it seems that a man um lit himself on fire on wednesday in front of the israeli embassy in boston um in protest of the genocide in gaza um, there's been surprisingly little coverage on this, I think, either that or my head's just been ostriched in the sand this week. Um, and I don't know the status of this man, like whether he survived or not, um, or what's happened since. Um, so if folks do know, please, um, put something in the Q and A's, but, uh, I, I linked to some stuff about it, but, um, beyond that, I don't know very much other than, you know, this is the, I believe third self-immolation at this point in protest of the war and of, of uh, U.S. complicity in Israel's genocide of the Palestinians. So, um, yeah, that, that just continues to be a, a real shock and horror. Um, but it's not all bad news. I did want to I did want to highlight um, some big BDS victories um, that have been coming down the pipe this past week. Um, the you know brown university's big bds vote which is upcoming has caused one of their trustees to resign um which you know i'm sorry what a loss that a hedge fund manager uh who was on the board of trustees you know was railing against the anti-israel bent of universities right now which like good sign means we're kind of winning something um and also the cultural boycott the way that that showed up at both the film festivals in toronto and venice um, if folks didn't see Sarah Friedland's acceptance speech, I would definitely recommend giving it a watch. It was really moving. I got some goosebumps. Um, and there are links to that in that article, I believe. Um, and just to show like the extent to which the kind of broad cultural um, imaginary right now on what's happening has become so decidedly pro-Palestinian that this sort of like vestige of a political class that's holding on to a position um, that no longer reflects anything but like a tiny sliver of the electorate just really doesn't feel sustainable, right? Like um, it feels like it is on the verge of breaking, which is why, again, feels like we're in a really seminal moment, but um, hard to say. But in the context of that, um, given the sort of opportunity we have in this moment to realign uh, the political class to like have some accountability to this like broadly, broadly popular opinion on how the U.S. should be relating to Israel. Um, I did want to note the launch of um, a rock action, a like political um, campaigning organization outside of a rock that um, can like endorse candidates and engage in campaigns that launched last night. Um, thank you to those of you on the call who were there. Uh, we had a really wonderful turnout, um, a really great start to endorsing some candidates that um, have taken a really strong pro ceasefire position and a really strong arms embargo position and other things that align with a series of principles around um, AROC actions um, 
perspective and like orientation towards which candidates it's going to support going forward. Um, you can check out the brand new, still somewhat in construction website at arocaction.org if you want to check it out. Um, there are some links in there to uh, donate or join. And so just as a quick sum up, um, things in Gaza are in a sort of like long-term holding plan. Um, it doesn't feel like anything there is going to change until it is forced to change. And so I think there are big conversations to have, to be had about what levers need to be pulled to make that happen. Um, the difference in how the U.S. has approached the killing of a pro-Palestinian U.S. citizen versus um, Israeli U.S. citizens uh, really lays bare its hypocrisy. Um, Lebanon stuff is looking terrible, but doesn't seem like a war is going to pop off anytime soon. Impossible to know, but it seems like we're in a holding pattern of high escalation. Um, we'll see what happens with the U.S.'s new ceasefire proposal when it comes out, if it comes out. But it's clear that the U.S. is sort of just doubling down on support to Israel right now. And it feels like it can do that with impunity. Um, but in the context of that, there is domestic vulnerability on the so-called bipartisan consensus on Israel. So like, how far can that stretch before it breaks? I think it cannot stretch much further before it does. I wanted to highlight three upcoming events very quickly. One, the Arab Cultural and Community Center is doing meet and greets with mayoral candidates in San Francisco. Um, I went to the one with Mark Farrell on Tuesday. I wish I had time to tell you about it. It was fascinating, not in a good way. Um, but the next meeting is with Aaron Peskin, who's also running for mayor of San Francisco on the 21st. I'd highly recommend you register to go to that. AROC's fundraiser is happening on October 12th, so there's still a little bit of time, but get your tickets while you can. Uh, and Arab Youth Organizing um, is launching its new um, uh, cohort. So please, if you know any young Arabs in the Bay Area who want to get involved, um, check out the link below. And uh, of course, just wanted to highlight um, the uh, Pack the Court for the Golden Gate 26 that Thomas had mentioned earlier, um, which is this coming Monday. I really cannot stress enough that folks should be there. And I did want to highlight one piece of information that I got from the AROC action event last night, which is that Brooke Jenkins's only opponent, Ryan Kochashte, um, is the person who identified that uh, Brooke Jenkins received gifts, undisclosed gifts from the Israeli government. Like he found it in her disclosures and then sent the story to the Chronicle. So that was fascinating. I heard that from him at the event last night. Um, so... Just to say, like, yeah, it's important to think about who can, who's got who's back in these races. Uh, check out the calendar for other events. Text uh, 833-633-0604 um, if you want to stay on our text thread. And then check out the Pal Media Tracker for updates on uh, the stories that inform this analysis. And that was a lot. My apologies, but thank you. Thanks, Samer. Um, yeah, that's thanks for closing it full circle. Really interesting that that's how, how those disclosures were made. Um and uh, important information for folks to know, especially since these, you know, to the point about these local races have consequences that impact this larger movement all the time. Uh, good for us to do the research and have this information readily available. Um, I think some of what you, I'm, su I'm surprised that you uh, described uh, Blinken's uh, imperialism as performative, <laughs> um, as opposed to Burns. Maybe that's true. Uh, I have to think about that as well. But uh, um, I like that kind of framing. Maybe <laughs> his outrage as his outrage. Sorry, yeah, his outrage, the idea that yeah. he has any sort of like yeah concern. Yeah, his imperialism is not performative. It's just oh, yeah. that's very deep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then. Um, yeah, I mean, some of the information about some of the sort of footage from uh, Gaza about the, you know, those, the craters. And is that in, um, is that in Khan Yunus or is that in? Uh, the, yeah, El Moesi camp, which is close El to in El Moesi camp. Yeah, like I think it also brings to mind some of what, as I was alluding to earlier, is some of the research and the um, documentation that everyone from the UN environmental program to um you know, the environmental justice and climate justice sector have been highlighting about the eco side uh, aspect of what's going on, which, you know, doesn't doesn't disaggregate uh, human loss from the environmental loss. Those things are one and the same um, and tied together, but also does highlight sort of the long term impact. So before we as we close out, I'll drop some uh, article links to some some interesting things that have been posted about emissions data uh, on, you know, as, as soon as like this past January about the high emission impact and then 
uh, some recent articles about the long-term impacts uh, for folks to repopulate the destroyed areas of Gaza um, and what some of those challenges will be environmentally, which are, are are part and parcel of thinking about a ceasefire, right? Like this is going to pivot at some point and in some way, shape or form um, around getting people back uh, into Gaza and into their homes and into being able to live sustainably and have access to water and housing and food. And so uh, some of that information is good for us to sort of be ready with and be educated about. Um, and there are folks who are doing that and also trying to, you know, very much integrate that into the analysis of the anti-war, anti-militarism work that um, is at the forefront of all of this. So uh, again, we'll see you all next week and hopefully see some of you or many of you, if not all of you on Monday um, and at many of the other actions. There's also, um, it's waitlisted now, but uh, Palestinian Youth Movement is one of the organizations that's hosting um, a, a popular conference for Palestine this weekend. Um, so uh, encourage folks to check that out as well. And then uh, we'll see you next week and we'll stick around to answer any additional questions and drop some links.